Hi everybody, welcome to May I Interrupt. My name is Craig Norman, my co-host here is Dr. Jason Jedlicka, and we are here from the American Academy of Optometry. We hope to bring with you, or bring to you, excuse me, interesting people that are walking around the floor of this meeting. We want to talk about contact lenses, we want to talk about instrumentation, we want to talk about anything at all related to the eye care practice. My partner, of course, will want to just talk about himself, but that's not really a problem. We'll forget that and just go right on dealing with our guests this evening. Jason, what do you have to say tonight? I love what the blue light does to your hair, Craig. It does. And, uh, and the, and the soft does. glow coming off did, the top did, of your did head. Did you notice that it's like the blue light special it instead of the blue, 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 no, it's the blue paint no. special. You are the blue light special, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> and as we get closer to dinner time, maybe the blue plate special. Yeah, the blue plate special. So wait a minute. Uh, so I, I thought you said we were picking up interesting people to interview. Today. Well, we are, except that the interesting guests we have scheduled for this session yeah. didn't show up. Oh, so, so that's instead, how we got John? So instead we're bringing Dr. John Gellis. Instead, got it, got right? it. And Love so it. with that, I would like to introduce Dr. John Gellis. Uh, he will tell you how interesting he is in oh, just a moment. Wow. Uh, and don't forget, this show is called May I Interrupt? And we expect everybody to interrupt uh, while we're talking. We hope we're not interrupting anything you're doing, but we're going to interrupt now, we, each other. We hopefully. actually do hope we're interrupting what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> John Gellis. Hi, John. How are you? Hey, Craig. How are you doing? Great to see you. <laughs> Good if to you see If you can, we'd like to have you seat right Perfect. there in the middle. Excellent. You get the throne. John, <laughs> better late than never, man. Yeah, right? <laughs> Welcome. Welcome what? back. Wait. Welcome back. Oh, gosh. Yeah, season John, two. Season two. John is our official first return guest. On May I Interrupt? He is. He is. As you know, what? It was episode three of season one. Oh, that's right. With Bazan. So, for, so yeah. for those of you who are watching this, who are just thinking, John is my guy. He's my heartthrob. I'm all about John. Go back and find... Is that you talking? Okay, maybe. But just, there might be more than one of us out there. Okay. Go back and look at season one, episode three or four. Yeah. Yeah. We got John. By the way... Don't forget, merch. we do have our merch. For those of you who are loving my water bottle or my golf balls, uh, and you want this merch, contact your Oculus rep or just call TJ or somebody and say, hey, I want a water bottle. I want a ball, pack of balls, golf balls. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll set you up, so anyway. So, John, thanks so much for uh, showing up. Uh, I, I have to say that you were late enough that we're now into season three. Yeah, true. So, just to well, let you know. And, and and also, I should let you know that Craig has been drinking wine while he was waiting for No, this. no, just a one. A big one. One wine, a and, big wine and drinking wine are two different things. Yeah, gotcha. I rest my case about what I said to you a little bit earlier. Thank okay. you. Okay. John Gellis, tell us your story. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I want to introduce John with a quick story myself. Perfect. Uh, there some, we go. <laughs> some years ago, do you know that John wanted to do a residency with me? Yeah. And and we wouldn't take him at IU? Been there. And now look <laughs> Done at that. Him. Now he sur surpasses what I do. Yeah. That's crazy. I know. That uh, I had the same experience. John <laughs> interviewed at MCO. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, we didn't think he was worthy of there, but we said, maybe you should try Bloomington. Yeah. <laughs> what, a bunch of, what a bunch of idiots we are, huh? <laughs> Sorry. All right. John, tell us about who you are. For those so, two, three people out there that don't know. Our oh, own. boy. Well, uh, I'm John Gellies. I uh, practice up in the uh, Corny Laser Eye Institute in Teaneck, New Jersey, and uh, in the uh, CLEI Center for Keratoconus and do a... Uh, a lot of work in uh, contact lenses and uh, keratoconus. For those yeah. of us who are naive with our geography, is that near New York City or something? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is right I, across I, the uh, GW Bridge. Teaneck, New Jersey is not on my geography <laughs> radar, so thank you for clarifying. So, John, how long have you been there now? Is it five uh, years? It's six now, I think. Six yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. 2016? Yes. Yeah, close to six years now. For, yeah. for those of you not aware, it's a premier cornea practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, also a premier contact lens practice, I should say that. <laughs> now well. it is. It yeah. wasn't always. I know. And, and with uh, some of the uh, most irregular corneas that you can imagine uh, that have been 
handled and managed uh, with inside the practice. Very appropriate that John is there then. Yeah, <laughs> uh, totally. Highly irregular. So, I'm, <laughs> yeah, highly irregular. I, I, I just want to mention one thing though, if I can, Jason. Yes, okay. please. Sorry, so we're when, getting off, when, I'm getting off track here. I gotta so, so gotta when, rein this in a little bit. When, when, boys, when John really. uh, interviewed at MCO yeah. residents, he knows the story. What I'm going to tell him is that. You know, one of the questions we asked him is, why do you want to come here, you know, besides the resume and all of that? And he had said, you know, some things about, well, we see you guys lecturing and you're out to the forefront. I want to be out in the forefront of the contact lens field. And I had responded, no, John, really, why do you want to be here, <laughs> right? And without hesitating a second, he, heard, he said, I heard you have focal points and I want to get my hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, look exactly. at that. Well, that tells you a lot about John. Do we all know what Focal Points is? Lens design software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> premier lens familiar. design software. Yeah. And uh, Focal Points. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, so. for sure. Nerd things. I mean, lenses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, John, this is of course the uh, um, this year's academy. You know. Yes. Yes. What do you got going on here? Uh, well, I actually just got done uh, doing a lecture with uh, the Innovations Council for oh, the uh, the go? academy. Uh, quite well, actually. Yeah, no, it was a very interesting, lively conversation about, uh, you know, AI. We had uh, Dimitri Azar there, so lots of smart lens uh, yeah. technology being talked about. So uh, monitoring of glucose, drug delivery, those sorts of things through contact lenses. So yeah. it was uh, it was a real blast. It was a good time. It was yeah. A good time. So must feel pretty good to be back in front of the academy lecturing and. Uh... <laughs> it's nice to be back in person. Yeah. You know, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm sick of seeing both of you guys on Zoom, and yeah, it's uh, it's nice to actually be, be right next to you. Where I, I, can, right. I can relate. I feel the, the same run. way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that especially is, Craig. But... That is that's <laughs> totally true. So so uh, just educate us a little bit. Tell us what your typical day is like in the practice. Uh, well, I roll in somewhere between 10 and 2 p.m. Okay. And just, uh, you know. Your patients eat a don't mind waiting till you get there. No, huh? no, no. I, I just I sit down, I eat a sandwich, and, uh, you know, I let my interns run the show. Yeah. And then, uh, then I go home. And that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's, that sounds like the life of a retinal specialist to me, not a contact <laughs> lens specialist. I don't know. No, but seriously, seriously so, so basically, the, the day will work a little bit like this. Uh, you know, walk in the door, and essentially it's a lineup of irregular corneas and ocular surface disease, and they're all there for specialty contact lenses and uh, management that way. Um, I teach, so generally at any given time, I have a couple interns with me, and every Tuesday, a resident from uh, Rutgers is up with us as well. Right, so ophthalmology residents yes, as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great time. You know, we really get an opportunity to... You know, not only just have fun with it, but also to you know really do some some really interesting cutting edge stuff and and really play with some toys that you are guys you guys really do a good. bit of research too, obviously. A uh, little, 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 little bit of research. Right. So you're, doing, you're seeing, you're trying things out that nobody else is. Yeah, yeah. There's there's quite a bit of research going on, a lot of IITs and sort of stuff. So we get a you know get to do quite a bit of really fun things. We're, developing a procedure we're working on you know higher as are you higher order aberration correcting scleral lenses various different designs of scleral lenses methods of fitting um, you know we're presenting some of our data on these here at the academy on you know higher order aberration correction as well as you know scan based uh, fitting and uh, and impression based fitting right. so so if we could build on that a little bit like Tonight, a couple of things that we'd like to chat about is lens design, which is going down that path, instrumentation, right? Yeah. And then this whole teaching thing that you're talking about uh, as well, not only in the office, but we know that you have an event coming up here in the near future that maybe you'd like to mention yeah, yeah, absolutely. as well. So, so as far as the lenses that uh, you're involved with right now, so is the high order aberration stuff what you're really focused on or do you have Knowing you, there's more avenues than just one. Right? <laughs> well, it, it's it's very very interesting. You know that we we tried to do higher order aberration correction on our own based on the principles and you know Marsac and Yoon's group right. their uh, their papers that have gone out and uh, God was it hard to do. You know a lot of hit and miss. You know you're trying to jailbreak devices to get the data out of it and then trying to you know 
bring together nine different scans to try and get the data that you need. And uh, you know the the system that's out there, uh, Ovitz uh, had put together this uh, opportunity to to really do this in a streamlined way, and that's been a really big focus of what we've been doing right. in the last year, um, and really getting some quite incredible results with right. it. Uh, just you know, several on average two lines of visual acuity improvement, yeah. 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 a lot of reduction in the HOAs about. 50 to 60 percent on average it was it, it's pretty remarkable stuff yeah. so that's one of the avenues that we're looking at right now yeah. that's been a lot of fun so i'm kind of interested in the uh, hoa arena mm -hmm. is every contact lens lab going to be able to manufacture these or they're going to be laboratory specific has that been shaken up yet at all so <laughs> well it's my impression that um, that most any lathe with the current operating software right. that's available could right. make a HOA correcting lens. Yeah, if they know the magic. Behind but there, there's the there's a lot to it. Right. I mean, it takes a partnership with somebody who can bring that data to their lathe. Sure. Yes. And that's that's really the the missing part right now. Although in, in some respects, I don't know. I mean, I, I like the idea that there's an out, there's outside companies that are doing this and it's not the lab itself. Right, yes. It's kind of like, um, well, not to name drop too much, but like Tangible Hydropeg, which is outside, right. allows anybody who wants to come to utilize right. theirs right. or, um, you know, things like that where you have a, an add-on product. And I think that's the way HOA correction will be is an add-on yeah. that's available to to any lab who wants to venture into that arena right. yeah right with a cost and whatnot but yeah yeah of course costly, of course yeah. so so that the labs won't be coming up with the ip right the outside designers that come so. up with the intellectual property have some arrangement with laboratories laboratory or laboratories right yeah and then and combined with instrumentation whether it be what you guys are talking about here. I know there's some of the stuff we're here at the mm -hmm. Oculus booth that Oculus is working on as well, mm -hmm. as, for yes. example. Correct. Yeah, Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, again, Oculus has the capability of doing HOA measurement. Um, and so I'm sure they're looking into this as right. well. And I do think that, um, I do think it's, it's going to be a permanent part of what we do in the future. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. So you think it's a game changer for them? Yes, yeah. I, I would tell you that the patients who get it have all noticed the difference. Yeah. And the when we looked at the data set, only 6% of the individuals who had had it done didn't get a visual acuity improvement in the Snellen line that they were able to right. read. All the rest of them, there was a four, or excuse me, a one to five line visual acuity improvement in these individuals. Now we haven't done the data sifting to be able to say, well, this guy is definitely going to gain five lines, right. or this right. guy is only right. going to get one. Right. But it, it's been very as, exciting as, as predictive, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's been it, it's been really exciting. Even the guys who didn't get any lines, though. They still improved in their level of visual, or excuse me, in their level of higher order aberration. Even the lowest individuals in this still improved thirty percent on their aberrations. Yeah. Yeah. and we would see all the way up to I think our highest was, gosh, seventy five percent ish, somewhere yeah. around there. I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere around that range. So what's it the, was pretty. Impressive. What is the um? What's the biggest improvement you've seen? in terms of acuity? Uh, so five lines, actually, yeah. So I had a, an individual that I, I just, no matter what I did, I just could not get this guy better than 2080. I sent him to retina because I was like, oh, there's definitely something else that I'm missing. This can't possibly be uh, that eye. And uh, sure enough, once we went through that process, he corrected all the way down to like 2025. 20, yeah. And, uh, you know, this individual, you're looking at any regular cornea patient. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a severe keratoconus. So, this is clearly a patient that you would otherwise have sent for a graft. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, with we 2080 had, best corrected. Right. Yeah. Right. We, yeah. we had actually had that conversation. Yeah. And this was, you know, one of those like, well, let's try this because this was when we first got the system and the ability to do this and we were doing the pilot on it. 
And uh, I was like, look, before before we do that, I just want to see what happens. Yeah. And that's what happened. And it was yeah. happy contact lens player. So, yeah, it's a so impact. What, what will be the impact for the regular cornea, number one, and what, number two, presbyopia? Ah, mm-hmm. so... So presbyopia. So I'm I'm gonna be careful so I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't pull any cats out of any bags. But I think there's going to be a very very good impact on presbyopia. Good. Um, I think when you look at uh, uh, sorry, I'm. I, I, <laughs> oh, you can just say there will be. That's good enough. Yeah, there, there will be good impact in that area. We did do a couple of normal eyes, and their response, though not as huge as what you would see in, obviously, in a, an aberrated right. cornea, right. they do still improve, yeah. which is uh, which is very interesting. One of the patients, an engineer type, sure. you know, very uh, worried about his, uh, his stuff, gained you know from a 2020 plus down to 2012 so uh, if you ever want to find what's wrong with whatever device or therapy you're prescribing yeah use the engineer as the case history 100 <laughs> percent. because they can list everything that's going oh he on. came in with drawings yeah the whole yeah. thing but yeah. i gotta tell you that was the best feedback i've ever gotten now afterwards even though he got his 2012 vision he still was good. yeah, but there's like still a little bit right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, over yeah. in this quadrant yeah, up right, here. Yeah. Right over here. In so. dim light. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So but yeah, no, it's 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 a really phenomenal technology. I think that this is going to be truly the next evolution in static visual yeah. correction. Mm-hmm. So along those lines for the uninitiated of uh, listening about what's happening with HOAs, do we feel comfortable that the device is going to stay in position and we've overcome the rotational well, it certainly has concerns, to. right? Uh, yeah, I still think there's a, a few challenges in that regard. I, I don't know, what do you think about, um, have you had any patients you've tried to fit in and had a hard time with rotation? And if so, how did you manage it? So, so yes, absolutely. We've had, we've had those exact situations. Mm-hmm. Um, the... We've done some work with uh, surface-based designs uh-huh. and yeah. putting the HOAs onto those surface-based designs. Um, just be careful because I'm not sure how much I can sure. say, but yes, we have we have done that in in lenses that had rotational problems with standard geometries yeah. and the inability to change the standard geometries to uh, to so, deal with that rotation. So, is surface-based yeah. designs is that? Something you can explain to the audience? Or? Yeah, yes, yeah. So, so, so basically, anything where you're getting a you know a model of the the surface of the eye. So whether it's derived yeah. from a shine flood camera, right? Like the Pentacam is able to create these, um, or you know, taking an impression of the eye and using that to be. 3D scanned. And Before we would refer to them as topographical based designs. So yeah. When there was only topography. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. But now with these other entities, of course. Yeah. That category. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Great. So that's that's really you know what we've used, and those have worked extremely well uh, for uh, you know rotational uh, uh, you know stability and translational stability, and you know like uh, Chris's group uh, actually the I think it's the Mojo group actually Kenny Tran had uh, a a poster at Arvo, I think last year, uh, that was looking at rotational and translational right. stability of these lenses. And Chris and would be Chrisin, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, when you you look at the uh, the stability of these lenses, they're, they're not. It's like on the level of microns that they're yes. translating in fractions of a degree yeah. that they were rotating. So it was a, a very good platform for this. Um, but the, the standard platform, standard geometries, obviously, work very, very well with this. But you will have those select patients where you just won't be able to stabilize the lens. And going to an option like that right. is, is going to be there. But right. you know, there are challenges with HOA sure. stuff. You know, you get scars or media opacities or anything like that. And, you know, you, you may have problems with that. What we kind of found, though, is that even those individuals who we go... You got a scar in the center area. It's kind of light. I don't know what's going to happen. They they're still improving, right? So it's 
it, yeah, I it's think, surprising how it still can. Yeah, we, we just got to, you know, kind of see what's what happens with this tech. You know? Well, you know that the uh, for the last 20 years, we've been talking about aberration control, aberration management, high order aberration, yeah. correction, whatever. Um, but for the first time, it seems like it's getting to be close. Oh, yeah. Or real. Oh, yeah. That after all that long of a time, which when it was 90% marketing and 10% product, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hopefully that'll be reversing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's such an interesting thing to just think of, you know, the journey that this had to go down. You know, this is, I mean, the, the first publications on this were like the early, you know, 2010s, right. you know? So you're looking at this going, oh, my, it, it took 12 years to I get know. it? Like, how, what was the hang-up? And it's... It's all logistics. But there's another like, 10 years before that when oh, high yeah. order aberration control was being pitched yeah. by some magic optical concept. Yeah, right? yeah. Like you look at like the, you know, the the uh, the various different, you know, patents that went through. You had the McNanty patent. You had, you know, uh, John's patent, you right. had Jamolis' patent, right. all these patents that were done. They were all like, you know, 2009 through, right, to the, you know, so it's clearly if you're patenting it then the idea of doing these things has been around yeah. a little bit before that right, right? <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a really really interesting thing that we're, we're now finally at the time that we can do this in a clinical yeah. in a clinical setting it's not just well, we can we can you know right. show it off in a research right. uh, uh, setting so, so. so John can we move in a, just a slightly different direction and that is talking in terms of the instrumentation Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we happen to be in the Oculus booth, and of yeah. course, there's an incredible amount of not only activity going on here, but also oh, yeah. instrumentation, uh, as there is other places, I'm sure, here in the hall tonight. Yeah. So where do you see us heading regarding that, and how, how do you incorporate technology yeah. uh, like what we have here at the Oculus booth yeah. in your practice? So when we look at tech, just in, in general, kind of where I, I see this going is kind of where Oculus is, has gone at this point, which is combining instruments, right? It used to be that, you know, that, like, let, let's look at keratoconus. You know, uh, it's what I do. It's what I know. That's all I can talk about. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I know nothing else about eyeballs. Right. There's pink we, stuff we, in the we, back. We, it's we, clear we, in the middle. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we, we know. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> So anyway, yeah. So, so the uh, so basically, if we're, if we're looking at you know trying to diagnose keratoconus to do it at a high level, you you really want to look at tomography, right? And if we look at kind of the gold standard of tomography, it's always been the Oculus Pen, right? Yeah. The the vast majority of studies are with that device, just just what it is, yeah. right? Because it's a fantastic device, right? And it's got a tremendous amount of algorithms in it that allow you to diagnose at a much earlier point. Yeah. Now, the next evolution on this, though, is adding things to that to make it a more robust system, right? Like, let's think about a couple different things, right? If we have disease and early disease being categorized by looking at multiple metrics, like, so, like, if we were going to look at glaucoma we look at IOP we look at you know the angle structure we look at the the optic nerve we look at you know, all these various different factors and we bring all that data together to create a risk profile and a diagnosis right Correct. exact same thing with keratoconus and corneal issues sure. right so we want to be able to bring in you know the thickness of the cornea the back surface the front surface but then we also want to bring in other things. We want to bring in what's the aberrometry of the eye look like. Right. Are those aberrations coming from the cornea or are they coming from the lens? Is it from the inside of the cornea of or is it from the other portion of the eye? You know? But then on top of that, you then want to bring into account biomechanical measurements yeah. of it, right? And biomechanics have been you know, talked about ad nauseum. That's really the final frontier in a lot right. of ways, of right? And Oculus has a great device for that, which is the Corvus. Now in the U.S., I'm I'm not sure that it has approval yet for its biomechanical right. factors, but my God, is it a robust system for biomechanics? Sure. And you can bring that all together. What they've created with this is something called the topographic biomechanical index. And that is essentially using the algorithms that you've built from putting together the thickness, the front surface, the back surface, 
and then all the metrics of the biomechanics of the eye together to come up with a risk factor based on that, which is just tremendous. So, yeah. you know, th there's so many applications and, and really all of this is going to come down to how advanced and uh, you know high resolution imaging can we possibly get out of an instrument yeah. and then how many of these instruments can we combine together so that it's a simple one stop right well you could decrease costs right. decrease footprint footprint yeah, tax is a big space. thing you hear a lot yeah, about right, right all the time right like i mean let's let's look at you know i mean it's right here so it's a Pentacam Wave AXL, right? For instance, we find that indispensable in our practice, but if we think about that for a primary care optometrist, right, it, it gives you all the bread and butter and more, right? Yeah. So you walk into the room, you, all you wanted was your auto refraction, for instance, right? Well, that came along with an axial link, it came <laughs> yeah. along with an entire corneal tomography, you know just about everything about that optical system that right. there is, and it sets you up perfectly for myopia management. Right. And it sets you up perfectly for having refractive surgery conversations right. with yeah. patients. Well, and you think about it even amazing. if it's baseline for the first time you see a patient, right? Just exactly. so you can just follow them over time to yeah. see what those changes yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, and you know that a lot of this technology that you're talking about right now, like the Panacam, has been around ophthalmology for a long time. Oh, right? yeah. It's been looked at as one of ophthalmology's premier devices. But over the last few years, it's great that it's you know, now being more accepted within optometry, a lot of the programs, yeah. right, Jason, have the instrumentation. A lot of the practices are starting to work with it. And, you know, it, it's helping them all just become better diagnosticians of what's Correct. happening. Just yep. data. Give me the data. And let me figure out what's happening yeah. from the data. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and the, the thing about this that gets so important and oh, why I think it, it's so important that you know optometry is embracing this technology is that you know we, we are the first people to see these exactly. eyes, right? The other portion of it is you know we're going to manage it with contact lenses. You got to be able to follow the disease, right? right? right. You, you can't just say, oh well, I fit a contact lens on that eye, and that's all I'm worrying about is right. the contact lens. You're using the contact lens in the management of the disease. Yeah. You're taking care of the disease. Yeah. So that's that's where it comes down to having the right tools to be able to manage that disease. Yeah. Like keratoconus is a progressive corneal disease. If we don't have the right instrumentation to follow it. Yeah, it's I think problems. No, I think and I think, you know, optometry has always been its strong suit has been the diagnostic part of it. Yeah. And 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 the diagnose diagnostic part of eye care is actually the more critical, anybody can prescribe a drug once you know the right diagnosis. Yes. <laughs> Getting the right diagnosis is the yeah. key. Yes. And optometry is really good at that. And having the data to make a better diagnosis, I mean, that's really right up optometry's alley. Yes. And so to, to, to not have that information, uh, to have it means you can really manage the entire patient's care. And again, yes. I think probably better suited to do than we often want to give ourselves credit for. Oh yeah. Yeah. 100%. Actually that this conversation resonates with me because the you know rather than have on the ophthalmology level have all the tools mm -hmm. that they can measure things, but they're only being sent to them after they're being referred from the primary point optometry. Mm -hmm. It would be much better fitted that within optometry they could perform all these tests and decide in advance what should be sent upstairs to, their, oh, yeah. to the ophthalmologist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the toy. I mean, let, let's just talk about toys, though, for <laughs> for, for the time being. Yeah. I mean, I I am addicted to diagnostic tools. Yeah. Like, right. I, Me I have, too. I have a problem. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I think collectively, we have a problem, but it's a good problem. And, and I got to tell you, like. Like the the tech that is in these tools is just yeah. wild, right? Yeah. Like when you think of like where you've been and where you can go, and what exists right now. I mean, these guys are just pushing the limits of it. Yeah. It's it's yeah. crazy. It's well, it's like the introduction stuff. of the first iPhone, right? <laughs> right. There's so much technology. Yeah. Right. Oh. And we thought at the time we just wanted to figure out how to make a phone call. 
And and now I've figured out that's the last yeah. thing you do with an iPhone that's right? exactly is actually make it. a call. Yeah. But buried inside these instruments are unbelievable amount of technology, like oh you're saying. God. And well, I was going to say too is is in some respects you would think maybe you have all these fancy tools that give you all this data. It dumbs you down. In reality, it raises your exactly. thinking oh, to a new 100%. level because yeah. you now have this all this more information and you can be more and more precise with more and more subtle issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh yeah. John and I just had this conversation recently and, and we referenced for instance it was like when OCT first entered into the game of optometry. Right. And optometry and maybe ophthalmology as well, but we're concerned with um, would that take the place of some of our diagnostic skills? But in fact all that it really does yeah. is it increases the diagnostic skills exactly significantly oh, yeah. in part of the decision making process oh, yeah. yeah 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 i mean it, it's the 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 algorithm i mean it, not even just the tech that's there but the algorithms that have been written off of the tech yeah. that are in these things is just phenomenal and the idea that you know pe people get a little worried about artificial intelligence right but a lot of people don't realize that every single day they're already working with artificial intelligence. I right. mean, right. literally anything that's an if then is artificial intelligence. Sure. So, but you look at this device and the amount of work, you know, in that goes into like the Bell and Ferocio, you know, right. the, the Ectasia displays on this that help to flag these sort of questionable corneas is is immense because there are a lot of these corneas that would have just totally gone you know, undetected. We right. would have gone, looks generally normal. Right. And right. if we can have that little alert that goes, oh, you know, we should, uh, you know, we, we should look at this a little bit more. We should consider following this yeah. individual for a, a period of time. Maybe instead of seeing him back in 12 months, I'll see him back in three, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, it really, it's impactful to what you're doing. And that, that I think is the most important thing is can a instrument impact your practice in a positive way, but also do it for the benefit of your patient in a way that's going to manage their health in a much better way. Right. Uh, right. You know, and, and allow for earlier intervention. Right? right. If I see somebody who's got one of those early signs and I follow them and I see a little bit of a change, I am much more gung ho about sending them for you know, corneal collagen cross right. linking. So, so John, of, uh, fun stuff. you know, one of the things I'm kind of interested in is that. So you're in a referral practice, right? You're getting them in through some referral mechanism and many different ones, yeah. right? And that your practice has to have a way to communicate that to the potential referrers. Yes. And I know that one of the things that you do to make that happen is education, right? Yes. Periodic meeting with people, you're here doing stuff. <laughs> but how do you reach a, a a bigger group like i know you're attempting to do that with something that's coming up in the near future yeah uh, how do you educate those referring doctors so they just feel better about communicating with their patients about why they're referring them to you guys in the first place? yes yes that's a, that's extremely important yeah uh, basically what we're trying to do is to educate uh <laughs> you know other practitioners on you know, what sort of decision making do you want to do along the way? You know, if this, then that. If you see something like this, they may be, you know, the beginning of keratoconus. Well, if you see this, that's normal, and they may be a candidate for XYZ right. refractive right. procedure. Right. And, you know, you can't really separate refractive surgery from keratoconus and keratoconus from refractive surgery. Sure. You know, you you want to you want to avoid a uh, an iatrogenic ectasia, but you also want to avoid doing a surgery on an eye that has keratoconus. Sure. And the management for those individuals who are not candidates because they have those are very very much the same. So, yeah. really, what we are trying to do is in a symposium that we're doing online. It'll be twelve hours of free uh, COPE approved education. Right. And wow. six hours of uh, free CME education for yeah. ophthalmology. And what we'll be doing on this is really a comprehensive refractive surgery course where we're going to go through each individual step of, you know, 
what do we look for in candidates? How do we do a really good preoperative work? Or what do we need to treat before they even come in for a procedure? You know, what That's sort wonderful. of procedures are there? Yeah. And then going on into the keratoconus day, which will go through the entire keratoconus management, yeah. everything from... So are you making making this directed only to your referral network? Or are you going to make it available bigger so, than that to... Yeah. I mean, the world is yeah. as <laughs> so, big as you want it today. Right. right? <laughs> so traditionally, we would give this course only to our referral network. Um, but now, because of you know the times that we're in and the ability for us to put this onto a a live webinar platform oh, great. we are doing this live for everybody to attend so yeah. you know if you visit uh, cleieducation.org dot org not com dot org uh you can register for this event and uh, attend it and you'll right get a tremendous amount of ce out of it and more importantly a whole bunch of education on you know, really what's available to manage these diseases and uh, options for... Uh, and for we know when people are seeing this episode or hearing it, that uh, it might be past the date. I mean, that it's, at the, it's at the end of November of this month <laughs> yeah. of, um, you know, 2021. But my sense is it's probably going to be ongoing because the educational process will continue to change. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. And this will be something that, you know, our, our goal on this is not going to be a one and done. Our goal will be to turn this into, you know, a, a real uh, real thing that we can do That's on a terrific. yearly basis. And then uh, hopefully have some um, uh, enduring right. <laughs> uh, content. Right. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Words are hard. So, <laughs> so, so. Dr. Jedlicka, we're about to wind this down. Yeah, no, I, that's that's really so exciting what, because that that just sounds like it's going to become the gold standard for anybody who's. I can just think of a year ago a student reaching out and saying, "Hey, do you have any good resources for being getting more familiar with refractive surgery? Because right. I'm about to do a rotation where we do a lot of refractive, and I could direct to this series. Say, this is it. Right. Watch this six hour, yeah. and you're you'll be as up to date as anybody yeah. could be. So, standard that's, of care for refractive yeah, surgery yeah. that's a great initiative yeah. it really is yeah, it really thank is. you because yeah. i do think that there's a lack of clarity on pulling it all together in one place for people yeah you know so yeah and, and for a long time it's always you know when you talk about refractive surgery all the courses are about complications in refractive surgery right? yeah a lot of it is and yeah. you know overwhelmingly refractive surgery is very very successful yeah and complications are very rare so understanding... Oh, it's because they're managed by contact lenses <laughs> when they're complications and we're contact lens people. Right, there you That's go. That's why we talk about it. <laughs> I know, I mean, but the number is so small. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is. you know, you, you look at it and... and uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, but... Yeah, sorry. But yeah, no, 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 it's good. But yeah, the uh, essentially, you know, if we focus on the things that we're actually going to see, right? Like one of the main things that we should be looking at is what's going on in the pre-op, right? Yeah, right. And we should be paying attention to, yeah, you know, changes in in ocular surface that are abnormal yeah. and treating that, of course. so that we don't have a complication that happens afterwards. Right. So you know, and that's to plug it, I guess. You know, right. you got things like the keratograph that can help you out with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, terrific. So, sure. Terrific. Yeah. Any closing comments for tonight? No, I just, I love, you know, the, um, I love this, this education um, that you're working on. I think it'll become a huge, I, I know I'm going to be getting my students to be watching it. And um, thank you. <laughs> I, and I appreciate, you know, your, your push for technology because I'm, I'm the same as you. I think the technology helps me actually be a better doctor, not it doesn't take over my thinking. It actually enhances my thinking. Yeah. So, one hundred percent. Just not to mention the part where the train has left the station, right? Well, you know, <laughs> that, some that, of that happens that, too eventually. That we so. have to jump on board, correct? Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, any last comments on? I uh, just in the last episode you're ever doing with us. Uh, I, I was gonna say I, we may it, have to break <laughs> off and do our own show, John. <laughs> uh -oh. I was gonna say if I ever get an invitation back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You'll show up on time next time. Sorry That'll about be... being an hour late. Yeah, I know. No problem. Well, John, thank you so much. I mean, we really appreciate it. Okay. You know, uh, you participating. Thanks, thank John. you to all of you, you for uh, listening and attending this evening. We're here at the Academy of Optometry. 
Uh, I'm Craig Norman. My co-host is Dr. Jason Jedlicka. Buy the merch. We have along with us <laughs> Dr. John Gellis. Uh, we have merch promoting, may I interrupt, <laughs> our best to Oculus for helping to sponsor this and uh, hope you will continue to uh, listen on. Jason, any last merch comments? Uh, no, just again, if you want it, contact Oculus. I'm sure they'd be happy to get you some. We love to spread, spread it around. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you.